Investors Network webinar. My name is Mark Pascarella. I am a board member for SBMMN, and also during the day for my day job, I am the Director of Debt Management for the Indiana Finance Authority. Uh, today we are all signing in for the webinar, which is a handful for the title. It's Public-Private Partnerships, What They Mean to State Debt Metrics When Incorporated by the Rating Agencies. And before I begin, I would like to do two operational details here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Corey Donnelly, because he will be the one who's behind the scenes making this all happen. And also, I'd like to thank Bob Watson. Um, Bob Watson, for the State Debt Managers Network, puts on all of the webinars or plans them out. And uh, his appreciation and support for this is very much appreciated. So uh, Bob Watson does a great job, and so this is just a continuation of the great work that he has done. The second thing I would like to do is I'd like to hand it off to Corey to make some brief comments here about how operation, again, we're going to handle the webinar. So, uh, Corey, can you take over? Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. So, uh, the GoToMeeting software um, allows for two different, uh, two different options for asking a question. Uh, the first is to virtually raise your hand. Uh, by doing, uh, to do that, you would click on the hand icon in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, uh, which is uh, part of the uh, GoToWebinar software. Um, if you do that, we'll know you'll have a question, and we'll um, unmute your phone uh, during the Q&A sec uh, section at the end of the presentation. Uh, the other way to ask questions is to simply type them in to the question dialog box uh, at the bottom of your GoToWebinar platform. Um, we'll read those questions out uh, also during the Q&A session uh, at the end of the presentation. So you can do those at, uh, at any time, uh, and we encourage you to do that. Uh, Mark, thank you. Thank you very much, Corey. Uh, before we get to our speakers here today, I just want to kind of give a brief introduction of the actual webinar. The purpose of this uh, webinar is actually a continuation of a breakout session that we had that was part of the 2015 Treasury Management Training Symposium that was held in May. Uh, back then, the SDMN put on a breakout session that kind of discussed issuers on how to decide whether or not to do a P3 which really focused on a discussion of value for money. I am going to take a quick second here and do a shameless plug uh, for SDMN and that symposium. I, I attended it for my first time this year, and it was a great conference to go to. It covered a lot of different areas that are very, very relevant to today's topic. So if any of the people on here get a chance to go next year, I do highly recommend. As I mentioned before, it does continue the discussion about P3s because while we can make a decision on whether or not the value for money is in play and whether or not a P3 makes sense, part of that decision making is going to be discussing what to expect from the rating agencies. Uh, Indiana has done P3s and we have crossed this question many times and we've worked hand in hand with the rating agencies to come up with how they are going to treat uh, the debt that is going to go on the state books, if you will. I will throw a word of caution here, I'm sure the rating agencies will do as well, is that while they will give their unique perspective on how they will treat P3s, uh, each deal is definitely different. And so while we have general guidelines, I'm sure everything would pretty much be deal specific when working with them. The focus of this uh, webinar will be really focused on uh, P3s where contracts that the states get into look a lot like that. And the reason I mention that is obviously Indiana, we did the Indiana Toll Road back in 2006. That was a little bit more where we offshot the risk to the private sector and received an upfront payment. We're not going to be focusing much on that type of product today as we will be focusing on uh, P3s where there's toll revenue or appropriation backed availability payments structures where uh, the contracts of the states do get into look very much like that. Next, I want to introduce our speakers. And before we introduce them, just like with Corey and Bob, I'd like to thank them. 
uh, transparency, transparency is obviously very important to the marketplace and being able to have these three institutions come on this webinar today to discuss a uh, type of structure that is very much in the news today and is ongoing and constantly changing I think is excellent for the market and I really do appreciate their time. From Fitch we're going to have Eric Kim. He will be followed by Moody's which will be John Medina and then Standard & Poor's will go be last which will be John Sugden. Before we start the P3 market as I mentioned before it is highly debated. It does seem like sometimes we take two steps forward and then also take a step backwards in this marketplace. I even use Indiana as an example. We, we've had, obviously had tremendous success with the procurement of two available payment structures, but we've also has been in the news, and I'll be the first one to admit we've had some situations where some projects have been put on hold. So as you can see, this market is changing rapidly, and I think the discussion is very timely. Without further delay, I would like to uh, pass on to Fit and have Eric Kim speak. Eric? Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today and taking the time. We really appreciate it. As Mark said, my name is Eric Kim, and I'm an analyst in Fitch's U.S. States Rating Group. I think you've got the first slide there now. So I'm going to break up my presentation into three sections. First, I will talk a little bit about what exactly is a PPP and specifically what that means for Fitch. Second, I will cover criteria that we recently published that covers the public side of a public-private partnership. And finally, I will end with a discussion of how PPP obligations interact with state ratings under Fitch's criteria. Fitch views public-private partnerships primarily as a procurement method. They are simply another way for government to get a project built. At a basic level, you have two parties. You have the public sector grantor usually a government agency here in the U.S., and a private sector partner that I will refer to throughout the presentation as the project company. The project company will typically have to secure some sort of financing, often through debt, and if Fitch is asked to rate that debt, our project finance team, we call them the Global Infrastructure Group, or GIG, will use the relevant criteria, which could include Fitch's availability-based projects criteria, and specific criteria for the type of asset, for example, a toll road. Now, supporting the financing, the PPP could have either a demand-based or availability-based revenue model. In a demand model, the project company takes on the risk that the asset will produce the revenues to support debt service. And in an availability model, the payments come directly from the public sector grantor. So under the availability-based model, which I think this group is probably most interested in since that's, what the, that's when the government becomes obligated, Fitch's ratings on project company debt are generally in the triple B or double B category. Construction risk is often a limiting factor, as is project management risk, which includes things like long-term operations and maintenance or capital renewal. One special case I want to note is a set of transactions that Florida DOT entered into several years ago, one for Space Coast Highway and one for Route 9B. Both were structured to eliminate project risk for bondholders, and instead the credit risk there was whether Florida DOT would make good on its payments obligations to the project company. So how do we determine the credit quality of that obligation? Well, we apply our criteria on rating public sector grantor counterparty obligations in PPP transactions. The criteria covers a few areas. First, we determine the, if the obligation is rateable under the criteria. Second, we notch the rating off the rating of the public sector grantor. And third, the criteria also explains how these obligations affect public sector grantor ratings. So now let me get a bit more in depth on the actual criteria piece and how it's applied. As noted in that criteria piece, an IDR or geo rating in the US context does not generally speak to performance on commercial contracts. We generally had the view that public-private partnerships are not just ordinary commercial transactions and that the counterparty obligation can be rated in a meaningful way. In the criteria piece, we lay out the key points that we consider distinctive features to make that counterparty obligation 
fit our standards for rateability. Uh, there are five factors, a clear legislative framework, the development of essential public infrastructure, grantor control of the asset at the end of the transaction, undertakings that are closely integrated into the, uh, the PPP financing uh, with a, a framework agreement of some kind, and that termination compensation uh, be a really important part of the transaction. So the first three elements establish that special policy objectives have been discussed and adapted to use a public-private partnership framework as an alternative method of procuring a key infrastructure asset that otherwise a government would be procuring through more traditional means. And the last two establish the public sector grantor's commitment to supporting the financing that's needed to design, build, acquire, and operate the asset for the public sector grantor. This is evidenced by being an integral part of the financing and agreeing to provide debt repayment in extraordinary circumstances, such as a default by the grantor or termination for public convenience. So once a PPP obligation passes that initial test for rateability, we use the grantor's general credit quality as a starting point in the counterparty rating process. For states, that general credit quality is expressed to the GEO rating. Outside the U.S., the starting point is the issuer default rating, or IDR, which is the Fitch term. And actually, over the next few months, Fitch will be transitioning all of its U.S. state and local GEO ratings to IDRs as well, which is consistent with our approach for international public finance credits. Now, the rating that's assigned to the grantor's counterparty application may then be the same as or notched down from the IDR of the grantor, but we think it makes sense for that general credit assessment of the grantor to be the first step in the analysis. You, you need a starting point. Most of you on this call are familiar with our ratings on state's appropriation back debt, and the logic here is essentially the same. You're looking at the credit fundamentals to determine the ability to pay, but then you reflect the weaker security by notching below that rating. In cases where a division of government, rather than the government itself, is the one entering into the P3 obligation, that division of the government is the grantor. And to get to the grantor rating in that situation, we would expect to notch down from the GO rating of the general government. So think of a transportation department, for example, of XYZ state. And we, we do that notching uh, based on the nature of the relationship between the grantor and the sponsor government. For states uh, where P3 transactions have generally been done, again, with DOTs, as grantors, this likely means that the starting point would probably be a notch below the state's rating. As an alternative, in the criteria development process, we did talk about the idea of doing standalone assessments of state DOTs based on their revenue streams and their responsibilities. But given the fact that transportation is generally such a core function of state governments, with the state ultimately having responsibility for funding and spending, we made the decision that the link to the state IDR makes the most sense. So once you establish that grantor IDR, the next step then is to consider the factors that inform the notching for the obligation. So then we move again from the grantor's IDR or the GEO rating to the rating on its counterparty obligation for the PPP project. Generally, we expect the grantor's counterparty rating to be within three notches of the grantor itself. It's obviously a very, very tight link to the grantor's own rating, which again reflects the high hurdles for rateability I touched on a few minutes ago. These are very strong commitments that grantors are entering into from our perspective. To determine that final counterparty rating, we look at several key aspects of the public-private partnership obligation, the legal framework that supports the grantor's obligation, how important the project itself is for the grantor, and how the P3 obligation is disclosed, and then how established public-private partnerships are as a general financing tool for the grantor. The tighter the legal, the more critical the project, and the more PPPs are a commonly used tool, the closer the counterparty rating will be to the grantor's own rating. In the criteria, we actually we have a table that summarizes the notching analysis. So let me give you an example of how this criteria is applied. 
in Indiana, the Indiana Finance Authority has entered into several public-private partnership counterparty commitments for large infrastructure projects that fit rates. In the IFA's case, the legal structure is intentionally very similar to the structure used for the state's appropriation debt. It's the same issue with the IFA, so it's very strong from our perspective. The robustness of the legal structure and its similarity with bond to debt is actually relatively a unique aspect of Indiana's public-private partnerships from what we've seen. In terms of the other notching factors that I mentioned, PPPs are clearly a prominent financing tool used by two governors now in the state. And the specific projects are both key priorities for the state's transportation department. That said, availability-based uh, public-private partnerships are still relatively new, as the first one closed in 2013. So all in, we would likely rate this one notch off the grantor's IDR, which will likely be one notch off the state's implied geo based on appropriation risk. And I'm, I'm saying likely because we actually haven't uh, put out ratings on these transactions for the counterparty assessment. We have ratings on the project debt, but we haven't run these uh, through our counterparty criteria yet. Uh, right next door in Ohio, a project company just closed on the Portsmouth Bypass transaction, which Fitch rated triple B stable. Again, that's the project debt. The counterparty in this case is the Ohio Department of Transportation. And the terms are more typical of what we've seen in other PPP projects. The importance of the project and the significance of public-private partnerships as a financing tool are similar in Ohio as they are in Indiana. But in terms of legal structure, the terms in Ohio are not specifically aligned with other bonded debt of the state. In fact, the state's counterparty commitment for this project is expressly subordinate to highway revenue and geo debt that's paid from transportation revenues. So we would likely rate this counterparty commitment two notches off the grantor IDR, which again would likely be one notch off the geo of the state due to appropriation risk. Now I'll talk a little bit about how these public-private partnership counterparty obligations play directly into state ratings. For US states, our position has consistently been that we consider these obligations in our calculation of net tax supported debt. The criteria piece provides some clarity on the number that we will use for the obligations. Specifically, we'll use the amount of project related debt covered by the grantor payment that would need to be paid in the event that the agreement were terminated, either for grantor convenience or, or grantor default. There are a lot of different ways you could approach this. Uh, we spent lots of time discussing them, but we believe this approach is the most transparent and as an aside, given the strength of state credit, it doesn't really make a difference to the rating outcome which method is used. The, the dollar amounts are uh, relatively modest in terms of differences, depending on the different methods. And as far as the impact of a default under a public-private partnership agreement on our assessment of general credit quality, I'll first note that underlying this rating methodology is our belief that these are strong obligations that a public sector grantor would continue to pay even at times of strain and that general financial strain would by definition be reflected in the issuer default rating for that grantor. So as I mentioned a moment ago, this is why the notching here is relatively tight. However, we do note that in the criteria that a default under the agreement would not result in an automatic action on the GEO or IDR rating of the related government, it really would depend on the specifics of the situation. So let me give you two examples of how public-private partnership counterparty obligations are integrated into Fitch's state rating analysis. Going back to Indiana, the state has entered into two sizable PPP transactions in the last few years, and Fitch has rated the debt for both projects. The state, and, and Mark, please feel free to correct me here, um, has an expectation of at least partial revenue support from tolls for the East End Crossing project, but the IFA's counterparty obligation under the public-private partnership agreement remains in place regardless of the adequacy of those toll revenues. 
Fitch uses the project debt as the input in our calculation of the state's net tax supported debt. That's currently just a bit over 900 million, the project debt. Now, that is a significant portion of the state's overall net tax supported debt, but that's only because the state's debt burden, it, the debt levels are so modest and it doesn't move the needle in terms of how we view the state's overall credit profile. On the other side of the state, Kentucky has entered into two recent public-private partnership transactions, one for an expansion of broadband access and one for a new state office building. Both were secured with what, using what Fitch views as an availability-based public-private partnership model. And as with Indiana, Kentucky anticipates one of the projects, the broadband access project, will generate at least some revenues to offset some of the Commonwealth's counterparty obligations. But Kentucky's commitment under the project's agreement remains in place regardless of whether there are any such revenues. Here again, using the project-related debt as a proxy, we add approximately $290 million to the Commonwealth's debt burden. It's a modest share of Kentucky's debt, and once again, it's not a rating driver in and of itself. So that actually concludes my presentation. Um, Thanks, everyone, again for your time. I'll be happy to take any questions during our Q&A period at the end of the presentation. And now I think I'm turning it over to John Medina over at Moody's. Thank you very much. Um, I sound like John and not an Emily, because I'm filling in for her. Unfortunately, Emily has the flu today, um, and she was unable to join us. Um, so my name is John Medina. I'm a Vice President, Senior Analyst in the Global Infrastructure and Project Finance team here at Moody's, and I actually lead our Global P3 Task Force, and as well as many P3 project ratings, um, as well as working very directly with the local government and states team as they develop the criteria that I will be speaking to today. So just going through what we'll have, we'll talk a little bit about P3s broadly. Eric did a great opening there, and thank you everyone for your time and Mark for having us here. Um, talk a little bit about the U.S. market, the evolution of sort of where we are, where we're going a little bit, uh, where we've been. You know, these aren't entirely new, although the availability payment structure has been coming into vogue over the last few years. Um, and of course, how we treat these, uh, which is a little bit different, but quite akin to what you just heard. So P3s in the U.S. market, same thing as Eric mentioned, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum, there's the demand risk projects where the government has no obligation, you know, we wouldn't ultimately look at that as a government obligation that's privately financed and those are your typical toll roads uh, that you're quite familiar with. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum would be an availability payment P3, uh, the ones we're speaking about today, you know, where ultimately the asset is built to a certain specification and once the government has accepted the project at final completion, they'll commence paying availability payments for the asset that's made available, and those as the availability payments tend to cover the operating and maintenance costs, debt service costs, and the equity returns to the private partner. As you see with availability payments, there are no exposure to volume and price risk or demand risk, um, though there is an adjustment for lack of performance. So there would be deductions should an asset not be available, should it not meet the standards and specifications that are within the original project agreement. And as you know, in the U.S., these are subject to annual appropriation, as they are with other governments. What we are seeing in the market that's not here on this slide, and we actually are publishing a, a detailed FAQ on Monday uh, that we'll send around, but speaks to something of, called a hybrid P3. So while that's both ends of the spectrum, you're starting to see projects that are somewhere in the middle. You know, we're starting to see an evolution of that where there could be sort of a guarantee of some base level of demand or something of that nature and that could be, you know, something akin to maybe a shadow road um, or potentially a new structure relating to higher education projects that can student housing. So we're starting to see more of those. Why do governments, why do all of these parties, you know, that are in a P3, why do they get into them? You know, you sort of always think about the incentives, you know, and of course on the off-taker side, you're looking at accelerating the delivery of a project, potentially getting more private investment within your assets and in your infrastructure as well. Um, a lot of times this is to alleviate congestion, to enhance your network, 
versus transportation to build a new asset, or of course, like with the Kentucky Wired project, um, you know, to build a brand new network throughout the entire state. Um, one of the incentives as well with a P3 structure when you're looking through not just construction but through the entire life cycle of the asset, you're really getting those benefits of saying, okay, how can we optimize the entire life of the asset? How can we look through the long term in order to have cost savings through construction as well as operations and maintenance? So the equity sponsors and investors and developers you know, do have a stake in it. They're looking for an equity return because they're bringing expertise to the table. And what we've seen in many of the projects that have come to market during the competitive process, you know, there's a widespread sometimes on these bids and that can result in significant savings to the government. Um, the lenders, of course, are looking for their return. Uh, there tends to be a bit better premium on and the margins on these projects uh, for their credit quality but investors really like the credit characteristics of infrastructure assets and they understand you know those in this space that once you get through the construction you know there tends to be appropriate mitigations there and you get into operations you're looking at a low operating risk profile and so that provides you know credit uplift in our view during the operating phase and that's supported by our you know default studies and project loan and PPP default studies that we published with a new addendum actually coming out specifically to availability PPPs next week as well. Um, design build contractors are obviously incentivized for the work. These tend to be larger projects because a P3 tends to optimize and provide those benefits when it's more complicated, uh, a bit longer in terms of coordination like a Pennsylvania Bridges project for example um, or a very large bridge that requires a lot of expertise and detailed knowledge like you know the Gothels Bridge. Operating and service providers get long-term contracts uh, to provide these services and that helps them obviously in their business as well. So looking at what, what is the government's role? What is your role? You know, at the beginning you are drafting your agreement. You're determining what your priorities are. You're defining sort of what are the requirements that, that will you that will drive you to enter into a P3. You know, as Mark mentioned, there's the value for money analysis, cost benefit analysis. Um, in the UK, they do a public comparator. There's a lot of ways in which to approach that determination. And I think you're seeing governments now that have this option really weigh it and sort of do a more methodical approach like we would see in Canada, like we would see in the United Kingdom. I think here in the US, governments are starting to take a step back, starting to reevaluate their, their process and determining whether a project goes traditional or goes the P3 availability route. Um, governments also are looking at affordability threshold. You know, if the project can't be delivered in three years, they may try another way. If it doesn't meet a certain threshold that they can fit into their budget, they may try another way. So that's up front. The government it always starts with the off taker, always starts with what they need, what they want, and that all goes into the project agreement. So if the P3 is decided, that negotiation will happen with the sponsors. You know, you'll have three bidders, for example, that are shortlisted, and you go back and forth negotiating that risk allocation. You know, what risks are the private sector willing to take? You know, what are they not? You know, for Miami Tunnel, for example, there was a significant amount of geotechnical risk. So a large geotechnical reserve was involved there. Um, in other projects, there may be right-of-way permitting, you know, where the government needs to sort of help with that and accelerate the project delivery because of the influence that they could have in that process. Um, of course, the government needs to accept the project once substantial completion is achieved and then monitoring the performance and the contract over time. So that sort of contract implementation risk that continues through the 30, 35 year tenor of the project and of course continually paying those availability payments as they come due. So PPPs in the U.S., you know, they're not relatively new. We've had different forms, you know, of the demand risk components and you can see those there at the bottom, you know, lots of different asset sales, asset monetizations, you know, the mid-2000 had, you know, as Mark said, the Indiana Tollways, the Chicago Skyways, the SH-130s, the very large, long-lived concessions um, that sort of potentially tainted public perception on some of the assets. Um, but those, you know, now moving into the availability side, we've seen, you know, more projects coming into the pipeline, starting with transportation, of course, because DOTs tend to be familiar uh, working with the private sector on large projects, contracting out on a design build basis. Um, but now we're looking at more social infrastructure projects. You're seeing the pipeline being built out with more water projects, more wastewater projects. Uh, the telecom projects and uh, different things of that nature that you know we had expected with courthouses and what have you to come through um, and that's actually starting to occur. Uh, we still see the market is very young. Uh, I think we're kind of where Canada was probably 12 years ago. 
uh, you know, sort of getting through, learning our process, defining, uh, you know, our, our divisions of government and the offices that are responsible for this at each state level, and that can help with the procurement process. You know, one thing we kind of say, and then we'll be publishing something later this year around, you know, the U.S. market is almost like 50 different markets. You know, every state sort of has its own legislative approval that's required in order to enter into these contracts, its own political environment, its own political risk associated with it. And so it's sort of developing that way, but the knowledge sharing is starting to happen more. You know, the, the IFA, for example, having successes here is being able to generously share that knowledge with other states. And we're seeing that happen also within the state into multiple levels of government. And we see that as a positive for the market moving forward because that knowledge share is sort of what will help solidify the market and sort of reach a level of potential standardization like you see in the Canadian P3 market. Um, we've mentioned the limited use of availability payments to date. Um, there have been several that closed so far in the last few years. There'll probably be a slight lull, you know, a couple have closed this year, but we may see just probably less than five or so moving forward. But even what we would consider a mature market, you know, Canada has 10 to 12 or so a year. You know, when the U.S. hopefully does ramp up over time, we still see this as a very small component, you know, given the, the strength of the tax exempt financing market here. You know, we don't ever see that really going away. We just seeing this as another tool in the toolbox. You know, if you have the option of doing this method, you know, why not choose it if it does provide the best value for money? So why are we seeing more? You know, clearly there is a potential uncertainty around federal funding on some of these um, transportation needs. Uh, we're also seeing the inducement of private investment and the, and the desire for that, given sort of not wanting to issue direct debt. Um, there's also been more government support, you know, the TIFIA program, private activity bond to provide it, you know, low-cost financing that have helped sort of get these projects off the ground. You've seen a lot of, you know, political support, past political support for some projects. And, of course, there's a new pipeline growing because many of our assets are old and they need to be rebuilt and they need to expand in certain areas. Um, we're also seeing experience, you know, as projects are being completed, several of them are being completed early. You know, LBJ was, <clears throat> sorry, Long Beach, um, excuse me, LBJ in Dallas was three months early, you know, NTE was nine months early, you know, many of these projects do finish early or maybe one month or so late, but they're all on budget, you know, within specifications and there's been pretty positive experience so far um, as they've reached in and gone into operations. Um, the construction industry also in the U.S. is starting to accept this, you know, fixed price approach, you know, not the change order after change order after change order approach. It's the lock it in up front and that's what we're going to pay you and that's what it's going to cost the government. So it sort of was, it took a little while to kind of, I think, get more comfortable with that, but that's being accepted more and more joint ventures are forming. Um, the knowledge that's coming from these larger international companies is, is quite strong and it's proliferating out into the local companies here in the U.S., which has been actually quite beneficial from what we've heard from a knowledge share perspective. Um, also, the investor base itself is larger. There's a lot of capital out there chasing projects. You know, there's just not enough infrastructure projects out there um, for them to invest in. We've seen a sort of a significant uptick in the development of infrastructure funds over the last eight years or so. And so there's a lot of capital in the infrastructure space looking for projects to get into. You see here on this slide those that have closed the availability payments. Clearly, they're in a certain number of states, and clearly most of them are in the transportation sector. You know, recently we did have the Kentucky Project come through, uh, which is very unique in its regard because it did have a different financing approach. It did have tax exempt financing, a deferred draw structure, which we've only seen in Europe, which is quite unique here in the U.S. Uh, a smaller project with the Michigan Freeway Lighting was quite small um, and also did reach close. Um, the other ones on this list you may be familiar with, and we have either directly looked at them, rate them publicly, or have looked at them on a direct placement basis. And always in the bid process, I've pretty much looked at every single thing on this page. And it's, it, I will say for some time, we will likely be able to name all of the P3 projects by name in the U.S. for a while. And you can see on the demand risk here, there's a lot more. You're looking at a bit more diversification, but of course, a lot of toll roads is pretty much where it is, and of course, a lot of managed lanes as we're looking at congestion relievers in urban areas. The pipeline is diversifying, though. There's the water project in San Antonio. Utah has a fiber optic. The higher ed space is starting to get into looking at this as well. You know, there's a lot more diversification in projects moving forward than we have seen in the past so far in the U.S.
So how do we treat these? You know, when we're looking at a state obligation, you know, how do we treat these as debt? So we did publish a, a publication um, earlier this year. This was back in February, sort of defining sort of what 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 is the debt like treatment? How do we include these in our metrics? And ultimately, we do view them as debt like. You know, these are strong contractual obligations, and we will include the liability as the government's direct debt. What we have decided was because there's so much diversification regarding the reporting on these to date. You know, not they're not all consistently reported. There's not clear government uh, accounting standards board guidance yet. So I think what we're looking at is looking at either the government's reported financial liability on its financial statement, if it is reported directly on the financial statement, we'll take that, or we'll take what we look at as a 80% of the outstanding debt, which if there's a project company default for underperformance. You know, there would be the obligation of the government. I believe the decision was not to put the 100% at the time because if the government were to terminate for their own needs, they would have to pay it all off. And they're kind of going into this structure because they're looking to finance the project over time, not pay it all up up front and sort of issue direct debt to replace it. So we look at the 80% as sort of the best proxy for what that government's obligation would be of the project debt outstanding. So. The government itself also doesn't necessarily report the liability during construction. So what we've decided also is to say, okay, if it's a five-year construction period, the way a P3 works, let's say it's a billion-dollar project, there's a construction spend curve. So as work is completed, the independent engineer will validate and confirm that, and then payments are made, um, and they can be draw, withdrawn from the bond fund issued to finance the project. So if you're 25% through a project or 20% in one year in, there's still, it's not usually a perfect curve, there's a lot of upfront costs, but there's still a significant amount of bond funds there available. So the government's obligation and determination during construction at that point is actually much lower than the full amount of debt outstanding because you still have those bond funds there. So we do a pro rata proportional amount as the project gets con progresses through construction. And of course, at the end, we'll put the full 80% of the, the project debt outstanding at that point. As you can see here, this is an example of the Long Beach Courthouse where we do count it as debt of the state of California. The other side of it is, is with local governments and states, you know, is the idea of self-supporting, which Eric had mentioned as well. Um, in our view, we need to see a demonstrated track record of this. Of course, many of these projects may be told, like you know, the East End Crossing here in Indiana. Um, but until those tolls actually demonstrate a history of showing that they can offset the availability payment and the full payment, you know, the debt portion, the O&M portion, et cetera, and also that that revenue coming from those tolls is sort of committed to offset the availability payment, then we would consider viewing that as more self-supporting. And so we would exclude the P3 availability payment obligation, that debt would be excluded from the net debt burden, but would be included in the gross debt burden. I believe that concludes the comments I had just on debt treatment, um, and I'll turn it over to John to take over from here. Hi, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank the State Debt Management Network uh, for putting this together, uh, specifically Mark Pascarella. Cord Donnelly and Bob Watson, uh, they've been working very hard to put this uh, webinar together to address uh, a clear question in the market. So uh, thank you all. Um, and, and thank you all for participating as well. I looked at the list of participants and uh, found a lot of familiar names. So it's, it's good to be uh, among acquaintances discussing this very important uh, topic. Uh, my name is John Sugden. I'm the analytical manager and senior director for Standard & Poor's U.S. States uh, group. And as you can tell from my last name and the company that I work for, uh, whenever we end up uh, deciding the order for these presentations, I usually end up going last. Um, so I will uh, try to... Uh, cover my remarks without repeating uh, some of the, the remarks that my colleagues from the other rating agencies have made um, and still um, provide you a good view of, um, of, of our view of, of uh, 
P3s and how we factor them in uh, into our state's ratings and, and our state, more specifically our state debt calculations. Okay, here we go. So I wanted to, to cover uh, several areas in my presentation, but I think uh, we can break the presentation uh, down into three parts. First, uh, some general background. And I think we've heard some of this already from my colleagues, so I'll try to be brief on that area. Uh, but some general background on P3s and, and S&P's view of P3. Uh, second, our treatment of uh, P3s in, ter in, ter in terms of our state debt analysis. And lastly, um, I'm going to cover our criteria and where, the, where this fits in into our overall criteria because I know uh, as a group um, you're all very focused on debt, but I think it's also important for us to take a step back and look at the, the bigger picture and what impact this might have uh, on the bigger picture. So that's uh, the plan for my presentation today. So P3s, what are they? I think I agree with with my colleagues that uh, although the term P3 um, is used very loosely and is is gaining a lot of uh, uh, popularity, from a rating standpoint, it really deals with these risk sharing partnerships. And you have a government on on one end who wants to provide some services, and the private sector who's there to, to help facilitate those. And there's certain benefits and certain risks that are shared. Regardless of how you, which type of model you use, um, typically there is a, a certain amount of construction risk transfer. Again, I think it was John who, who mentioned the, the fixed price approach. Um, and, and that has certainly, uh, some benefits. There's the operating risk transfer as well, uh, and uh, depending on the model, there could be uh, volume risk transfer. P3s have been used globally for quite a while, uh, but it's only recently that they're gaining more popularity in the U.S. Um, and I think, to some extent. And, and this might be uh, maybe the first iteration of P3s. I know this is a market that's evolving. But in some extent, they're different in the US to what they are in, in Europe and Canada. And I think in the US, we're seeing more of a bent towards availability payment. And I'll go into how we view those in a minute. But I think there is certainly a certain trend towards that, although certainly there is there's both volume deals and availability deals in in, uh, in the U.S. as well. In in addition to Indiana, uh, which we're all uh, familiar with, um, California, Texas, Florida, Virginia, uh, and more recently uh, Pennsylvania and Colorado have done uh, P3s that we've looked at and that we're uh, we've analyzed. The Certainly one aspect of the P3s is what we have come to know and love as the concession agreement. And anybody on the phone who has uh, worked with these uh, can attest that they're uh, several reams uh, deep and certainly uh, a lot of fun to, to read and with very uh, specific uh, terms. And it's kind of a combination of a construction manual and an indenture. And it contains a lot of conditions and a lot of um, different requirements that span a, a wide gamut of, of terms, um, but which usually include, and, and sometimes they're divided into several volumes of, of different documents with different names, but in its combination, it includes uh, your conditions for, for payment um, and uh, the requirements for the ultimate product that you're uh, trying to, to have delivered. One thing that has made uh, P3s uh, 
uh, in, in some circles uh, attractive is that, uh, and specifically during the time of, of the Great Recession when some states were hitting their debt affordability uh, limits, is that it, in many cases they're not considered within your debt affordability models, and that makes it, uh, to some extent, uh, it, it's one less hurdle. That's not to say that there aren't many others that you need to, to deal with in order to approve a, a P3, but certainly that has been something that's attractive um, for some states. In others, uh, for example, like the state of Florida, it is considered um, as part of their debt affordability model. So again, there's a lot of um, variability here. I think it was Mark Pascarella who said it at the beginning uh, of his webinar, Certainly there are no two P3s that are alike. And I think we're continuing to see this market evolve. And to the extent that we see more and more um, states approve P3 uh, laws and, and P, uh, approve P3 projects, we'll continue to see greater and greater variability. And so just like the state constitutions, the state enhancement programs, uh, and P3s, none of them are alike to each other. They're all slightly nuanced. Um, and that makes it difficult uh, for it to gain greater acceptability. There is no one model. It's not cookie cutter. Uh, they're all really quite unique. So previously I mentioned uh, the, the volume base and, and whether or not there was risk uh, sharing over, over volume. And I think that's a major distinction uh, and one that is very important from our standpoint. Uh, for vo volume based projects, as the name would suggest, um, volume is, uh, is shared with a private developer. The private developer assumes uh, the risk for, for either high, the, the benefits from higher than anticipated volume or, or the risk for lower uh, than anticipated volume. And these deals typically include uh, either an upfront payment or payments over time in exchange for allowing the private entity to operate and collect the project revenues. And typically uh, a toll road would uh, follow this model and so you're really doing a concession like the Indiana toll road. Um, and, and for some, this is an attractive model. Uh, you have somebody else take care of the construction, operation, maintenance, and the risk. And there's very little recourse uh, to the government in lower than expected usage. The availability-based model, and that's the one that we're uh, mostly concerned with, the government enters into these concession agreements, and they agree to make milestone and availability payments in exchange for the construction, financing, operations, and maintenance of the project. And I agree with Eric that to, to some extent we also view this as, uh, as a procurement method. The funding for these payments usually comes from government revenues, uh, although there might be instances where there's a portion of federal revenues as well. When we say government, we mean state, uh, state government. Uh, and so there's a direct linkage there with with the state. In other cases, uh, where total revenues are pledged, uh, government assumes the risk of lower than expected usage. And and I think this is we're seeing this in some of these projects where you expect either it's a new project that there isn't uh, a lot of understanding of what the volume is going to be, uh, but it serves a, a public purpose, and the government wants to ensure sure that uh, it gets built um, with the hope that uh, the toll revenues will eventually replace the, the commitment or, or rise to the level where they provide self-support and where it's only requiring a short-term investment from the, um, from the state during the startup uh, phase. Uh, there's also availability-based payments where for uh, political reasons or for 
you know, just the, the view of the, the government is that they shouldn't toll the road uh, where the only revenue that's pledged is basically an appropriation from the state. Um, and and the usage is less relevant because you're not generating a, a revenue. You're just straight on absorbing the cost uh, from the beginning. So how do we treat these and, and why do we consider these to be uh, debt light? So first, there's, these are long-term obligations to pay. Um, more frequently than not, the revenues that are pledged to pay it are the same revenues that you're pledging uh, to pay other debt. It's very similar uh, to your debt in, in many ways. You're using it to fund your capital improvements just like you would debt. Um, there's a fixed commitment, um, much like debt, and if, if you decide to break the contract, there are costs associated with it. Um, finally, the, the ownership of the asset resides with the government, uh, so we don't see it necessarily as an operating lease. It's typically more uh, like capital, it's a capital investment. So we're looking at these projects, and I think uh, both Eric and, and, and John Medina uh, alluded to this, there's two angles that we as a rating agency take to evaluate this. One is that typically in these agreements, there is a percentage of the cost that's funded through debt. And in analyzing that debt, we're certainly looking at, at the commitment that the state is making uh, to make those payments to the, to the project and ultimately to the project bondholders. So in our process of evaluating the project debt, we're certainly looking to the state. And as Mark uh, will attest, when we worked on several of the Indiana transactions, um, in this process, we will reach out to you and say, let's talk about this transaction. Let us understand how this fits in into your bigger picture. Let us understand where the payments are being made out of, how this is budgeted for, what the revenues are, what your expectations are. Um, in terms of how it will be paid, et cetera, et cetera. And so in, in the case of uh, Ohio River uh, Bridges, the state clearly said there are total revenues. We don't know what they're going to be, but certainly we're putting our full weight behind it. And if you look at the agreement and the terms of the agreement, it is almost identical to other agreements that uh, we rate for Indiana Finance Authority in terms of the commitments that they're making, their obligation, uh, how this fits into their overall picture. So in looking at that, what we will call counterparty risk, the risk that the state will pay or not pay, we're either looking at the revenues that are pledged and the strength of that pledge, if it's individual revenues, or we're looking at uh, their appropriation and, and how, how that is, if, if that's what they're pledging, uh, or if that's how they're committing, just a, a standard appropriation, we'll look at how that fits into the, uh, fits and compares to the state's other appropriation debt. And clearly, um, we have two pieces of criteria that we rely on. One is our appropriation back criteria, the other one is uh, rating government department appropriation, which is uh, a, an additional piece that we use together with our appropriation when the debt is actually funded through a specific department. And where we look, again, at the linkage between the state and the obligation, whether this is broad approval, um, how is it budgeted, who oversees the debt? Does the state consider it debt or not? Uh, how do they report this? Do they factoring factor it in um, to their 
uh, debt statement uh, or their debt affordability models. And so in rating the project debt, we look at that uh, at the state from that perspective. The other angle is understanding that if we consider this to be a commitment of the state, then clearly we need to understand what the impact is on the state debt metric. So in order to understand whether we should add this uh, to the state debt metrics, we go through several different steps. Back in um, January 3rd of 2011, when we uh, released our, um, our criteria for states, we mentioned P3s. We said, to the extent that P3s are pre becoming more prevalent, and these are long-term funding commitments, we will look uh, at these obligations to examine the nature of the obligation to pay and to determine whether this should be considered a uh, debt of the state or contingent liability. So again, we're looking to see what your commitment is, what your role is in making these payments, and what is the revenue that will be used to, to, to make these payments. If it's an enterprise revenue alone, if it's a toll road where you're not really providing any other security other than the toll revenues, we consider that a volume-based project. It's not going on your debt statement. If it's an enterprise revenue with tax-backed revenue support, or if it's a tax-backed revenue support uh, with no project revenue, then we need to look at it a little bit more closely and determine what should be the right amount of, of debt that gets added to your debt state. Okay, so in the first case where there are additional revenues in addition to the traditional tax back revenue, and, and Ohio River's crossing is, is an example. The toll revenue is slow, they're, they're available. We will evaluate whether or not those toll revenues are sufficient to provide self-support. Um, in doing so, we'll try to determine also when these revenues become available. And for example, for milestone payments, and we look at milestone payments and availability payments separately, for milestone payments, these revenues might not be available prior to the project completion. So that makes self-support unlikely, unless there's another source that's not really tied to the project. Um, to the extent that the additional revenues are, are sufficient, we won't count them. If there's partial support, will give you partial uh, partial credit. Again, this has to be, because of the risk, and, and a lot of these are projections and untested uh, estimates of what the volume is going to be, we want to see some uh, track record uh, before we give you uh, that self-support. And if there is, because of details in your uh, debt structure, whether you have a big spike uh, in your debt service or whether there's some economic condition or something else that we think could affect future performance, if we think that the coverage provided by the, to by, by the revenues is going to be insufficient, then we might adjust our view of, of self-support. So once we've determined whether we're going to add them or not and to what extent, there's also some additional adjustments that we make. Uh, so one, will provide the self-support, as I mentioned before. Two, for availability payments, because there is a component of O&M, we will take that component out uh, so that we're just really focusing more on capital. And then because these have uh, a certain element of whether it's interest on the debt or return on equity, 
will take the NPV of the future payments to determine what should be added to your debt statement. As I mentioned earlier, um, we look at timing uh, to determine, uh, we look at milestone payments separate from availability payments and adjust the timing of when we add them to your debt statement. Fortunately, milestone payments, although they don't typically benefit from self-support, they're typically short in nature. So you don't have, you don't necessarily have an overlap of milestone payments and availability payments. Um, we, during your construction phase, we treat availability payments as contingent debt. And what that means is that it helps to inform our view of what your future debt uh, might look like, but it doesn't necessarily get scored as part of your debt. It helps to inform our forward view of your credit. Once the project is finalized, substantial completion, um, and you take over the asset and it starts operating, at that point, we look at your availability payments. And those typically, those miles, th those changes typically coincide when, when you start making those availability, pay availability payments. So to the extent that you're making those availability payments, we start counting it towards your debt. So now, let me take a step back, and, and we've talked about this debt, how we view it, but where does this fit in? So in our state criteria, we have five factors of which debt and liability profile is only one. Within the debt and liability profile, we're looking at three sub-factors, which basically is your debt burden, we're looking at pensions, and we're looking at, uh, at OPEB. And the metrics that we use are within fairly broad ranges. So we don't expect this necessarily to, to move the needle one way or another. Uh, but it's certainly, like we do with private placements, we want to know what your full commitments are, and therefore we'd like to include it in, in your debt, and we think it's the right thing to do. However, you know, even though we don't think that these will move the needle that significantly, I think it's important for us to have an open discussion as to how we view it and what the potential impact could be on your debt statement and then uh, to some extent on your rating. But again, we haven't seen, uh, this is a fairly new um, industry uh, and, and model and we haven't seen uh, any significant impact on, on ratings because of P3s. The next two slides just talk about our, or just for reference, I'm not going to go through them, but really provide you our metrics um, as well as some related uh, research and criteria, all of which should have included uh, with your package. At this point, this concludes my presentation. I'll turn it over to Mark for uh, the Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and uh, I will have to remember the fact that Sugden and Standard Poor's will normally put you dead last. So I do yeah. <laughs> uh, appreciate that because that, that is a true statement. But uh, again, I will reiterate my thankfulness to the three rating agencies who did come aboard. I mean, this is a new topic, or not a new topic, but a topic that's constantly changing. And I think that all of you thoroughly did a great job. So uh, my hat's off to all three of you for coming on and doing this. We do want to open it up to some question and answer for uh, Corey. So, Corey, I'll hand it back to you just to remind everybody how to ask questions. Sure, Mark. Thank you. So, again, there are two ways to ask a question. We already have uh, at least one. Um, if you would like to ask a question over the phone, uh, hit the raise hand button, which is an icon of a hand in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. We'll know that you have a question, and we'll unmute your phone and ask you to, uh, to ask. You could also type in your question into the question dialog box uh, towards the bottom of the GoToWebinar platform, and we'll read that question out for you and have the, uh, the speakers um, weigh in on it. Well, if we got one question right now, let's go straight to uh, our membership for the question. Sure, thank you. So um, the, uh, the question is, as P3 models are currently being examined at the local level, i.e. counties and cities, 
as an alternative source of funding, what kind of rating considerations in terms of notching down of ratings uh, from the state agency level sponsored procurement? Are you referencing the rating on the project? Or are you speaking to Fitch's approach with the, the rating on the payment obligation? Uh, I am uncertain about addition. Um, the I mean, I can just came, speak, this is, uh, what, maybe we can get some clarity, but I can just kind of speak generally. This is Eric Fitch, just that criteria that I talked about doesn't cover just state. It's actually an international criteria. So we would apply those same tools, that same analysis to whether, to if it's a local government uh, accounting that's entering into the, the transaction. Um, and we figure out, you know, make determination what is the, the grantor here, whether it's the county itself, the county's Department of Transportation, um, and determine, you know, what that rating is and then notch down based on the factors that I laid out. So we would simply apply the criteria that we laid out. It's an international criteria that applies to state and local governments or uh, international public finance uh, entities as well. Uh, they, they did add a little bit of uh, clarification. They um, continued with uh, that they're interested in the project rating. These ratings are not notched ratings. When you're looking at a direct project rating, you know, from Moody's perspective, you know, we have two different methodologies, one for construction risk and one for the operating phase. So there is a definite disconnect from the off-takers rating. You could have a AAA off-taker and a BAA2 rated project in construction because the construction risk may be quite high. Once it gets into operations, for our most mature projects in the United Kingdom or those in Canada or Australia, they tend to be at least you know a couple notches off of the off-takers rating in full steady state operations after there's been a proven track record. And the reasoning behind that is, you know, when you look at the default experience in this space and you look at the recovery levels and you look at the payment obligation, as others have mentioned, you know, it's not a direct obligation. It's not a one-notch obligation. You know, it's somewhere down in the waterfall. And at the same time, the project itself is very highly leveraged. You know, you're looking at 7 to 10 percent equity. You're looking at coverage ratios in the 115 to 12 range, um, you know, for some time. So there's also not a lot of flexibility around that. You know, once you're sort of locked in up front, you know, you're pretty much locked in. So you don't have a lot of opportunities to really raise additional revenue if something were to occur or some other change were to happen down the road in terms of higher costs. So the way you forecast those operating expenses, the life cycle costs, you know, that's all bespoke up front. But if it's higher, that's ultimately the project could bear that risk. So if it's not contractually passed through to an operator that's guaranteeing that performance, it's retained at the project level, which most transportation projects do self-perform life cycle, so they retain that cost risk long term. So the, the ratings on the project are very different than, you know, it's not a, a notched type of approach from Moody's perspective. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo and, that from Pitch's perspective. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Was that John? I don't want to. <laughs> sorry, I'm uh, again going last. Uh, and, no, no, no. From, from SMP's perspective, I think the, the same is true as we, as I stated earlier. We're looking to the nature of the obligation to pay as an element that goes into the project debt, but it's not what drives the, the, the project debt rating. It's more to gauge what the commitment is to make those payments, um, and that'll be uh, pegged to either the state or a local government, whoever is a, the participating public entity. Pitch's perspective is essentially the same. You know, the, the notching that I talked about, the counterparty approach, that is how we get to the counterparty obligation rating. Again, that's the public sector entity's commitment. The project rating, as I stated in my presentation, generally we're talking triple B, double B range um, category because of project risk. And that is true for S&P as well, in terms of the rating uh, range. Do we have any others, Corey? Mark, we have uh, the, the Rhode Island Treasury uh, would like to ask a question um, uh, over the phone. I'm going to uh, see here. Oh, it looks like their hand went down. They may have answered it with the, uh, the last bit of answer. Well, while we wait for some other questions to pop up, and Corey jump in if one does, 
Okay, I'll ask all three to respond to this. Maybe we'll start with S&P on here to try to give John a little uh, hit back to the other rating agencies to go first. But with in regards to qualitative factors as far as looking at states, do you guys ever take into account, uh, for example, you know, Indiana grappled with for the bridge, do we charge a toll? And we felt that the tolls really would offset some of the cost, if not well, we believe eventually all of the cost of the availability payments. Do you guys take that into account when you're doing ratings, or is it really just more of where it falls into the numbers under the debt metric? Well, so we, it is factored into the rating to the extent that uh, one, um, certainly if the revenues are there and we consider it to provide self-support, you're getting some credit on, on the debt metric. I think from a more holistic standpoint, we're looking to see at the impact of, of, uh, of the project and if this is something that's going to have a beneficial impact uh, for the state in terms of economic development or other things. But that's a little bit more of a qualitative assessment um, than, than a quantitative assessment, obviously. Fitch, Moody's, yeah, how do you guys, I mean, do you guys take the same approach? Um, it, so I would say that when you're looking at qualitative, of course, the metrics are the numbers where it's going to show the impact. Um, but when you're looking at qualitative, you're looking at the prudency, right? Is If this is something that could provide cost savings or something of that nature, you know, and it's an opportunity that's in your... Um, your toolkit, you know, why not take this approach if we're taking a traditional approach? Or if you are taking this approach, is it a prudent approach or not? You know, are you kind of doing this because it's in vogue and everyone's doing it? Or is it actually providing good cost savings? Or is the, you know, two-year process to do your first P3 delaying the, the completion of, you know, fundamental infrastructure that needs to be done earlier? Um, where we come into question is when you're looking at the project itself. So if I'm looking at a demand growth project and they the, the sponsoring government has an opportunity to do an availability payment, that's where the questions come into play. Well, why did they go demand risk on this when they could do an availability payment and, you know, not have to take that, you know, revenue risk in the private sector, you know, at the project rating level. So in, in that regard, that's when you're really starting to evaluate the differences and that risk allocation that, you know, whether the government is pushing too much risk to the private sector and to the project and how much they're taking in order to mitigate it when looking at the project level assessment. I think from Fitch's perspective, when it comes to whether or not a state decides to have a project told, uh, it's really a policy choice. Um, it, it does, of course, factor in in terms of what, if there are toll revenues that are supporting a government's availability payment, that becomes self-supporting when there's a demonstrated track record, which I think it sounds like that's consistent with the other agencies as well. Um, but whether or not a state decides to add tolls to a project, policy choice, not a direct credit factor from our perspective. With the, uh, I know Moody's touched on where they think the market is going, and I, I think, I remember from the conference we had in May, there still does seem to be some skepticism. Maybe I'll ask for S&P and Fitch to kind of discuss their views. Do we see this as it's gone far enough down the road to where this will become a significant way of funding, whether it be transportation or social infrastructure, and that debt managers should really get prepared to be a part of this, or do you think it is so fragmented because of the 50 different uh, states that really it will just continue to kind of muddle along with some states embracing it and other states shying away? So uh, this is John Sugden, uh with S&P. Um, from our standpoint, certainly the interest in exploring this model will remain and will continue to grow. The size of the infrastructure needs uh, for this nation and, and globally are, are significant. So I think with the concern of, uh, over federal funding, uh, with the need to really maintain our infrastructure and expand our infrastructure to remain competitive, states and governments uh, are going to be, and local governments are going to be looking at different um, opportunities and different methods that can help them achieve their goals. 
you certainly have several states who have uh, who have already successfully done P3s, and in those states, we expect that model to hold and to grow. You also have about 33 other states that have at least passed laws that, that allows them. Um, but you also have certain barriers to entry. Uh, certainly, the, the complexity, the large size, um, as well as the lack of uniformity are, are barriers to, to entry. You could also consider some political considerations when you know, some of these projects start under one administration and are expected to take effect under another. And then finally, I think maybe from a psychological standpoint, uh, there could be an element of questioning what the role of government is and whether or not we're gotten to a point where we feel com comfortable turning what we might view as, as, as a nation, as a government function over to the private sector. And so despite our free market inclination and, and, and how strongly we support free markets in the U.S., it, that connection and, and that shift from the public sector to the private sector might have not occurred. And so certainly um, we view those as, as barriers. And then to some extent, to the, to the extent that you have a functioning tax exempt municipal market that allows you low cost financing, that also doesn't create uh, an incentive for you to switch models if, if the current model uh, seems to be working and, and gives you readily available low-cost uh, access to, to funds. So I think we'll see interest uh, come and go, uh, but eventually over the long term I think it, it'll it'll uh, become uh, greater, although not necessarily substitute the, the municipal market. So from Pitch's perspective, I think I would agree that there's clear infrastructure demands globally and certainly in this country, particularly for transportation. And as long as that pressure is there, then yes, public-private partnerships will be in the mix. But I do think it is very state, even issuer specific in some places, clear momentum to move forward with public-private partnerships as a procurement method. In others, it's not really on the radar screen or it's even out of favor. Indiana is an interesting example. I think Mark alluded to this in the, in the intro. The state has demonstrated some clear commitment to using this model, and they pursued several and successfully. But at the local level, uh, a place like Indianapolis recently pulled back on a large public-private partnership they were moving forward with. So it does vary. Um, but I think that the, the option is here to stay. It just it really depends on your environment as to whether that's something that you will pursue or be able to pursue. And maybe tagging in on that, you know, for this probably be the last question we do here. Um, where are you guys seeing from the federal government? I mean, do, I hear a lot about people talking about P3s and private sector coming in to kind of help states and the you know, just the United States in general with its transportation needs specifically seems to be the one they're focused in on. I mean, is that something we see just from maybe the Obama administration, or do we see from both Republicans and Democrats that they seem to be wanting to push the private sector a little bit more just due to the problems that they're having with getting highway funding done? What's interesting about that is that, you know, this particular procurement method should be politically immune. You know, regardless of what party is in favor, regardless of who's in charge, you know, this is a process that, you know, looks to look at a long-term development of a project that needs to be maintained over time to deliver a public service, you know, effectively. You know, you will have that asset maintained at a certain standard consistently over time and will not wane. There will not be underinvestment during times of capital austerity, you know. And so the federal government has actually had many initiatives, you know, under this administration to help with that knowledge sharing to sort of now there's some proposals to help expedite permitting for different projects of that nature. You know, the federal government themselves, you know, should they look to get into this, could rebuild the Veterans Administration hospitals, you know, taking this approach, you know, as we saw in Canada and the UK. So, you know, I think when it's starting to go down to the local level, 
is, is where you're seeing a lack of potential knowledge and sophistication and where we need to have more of these agencies formed at the state level. Like I know there's certain P3 offices for some of the states on the phone and others are forming them to help advise at the lower government levels and to help proliferate that knowledge share. You know, you have that in Canada with, you know, BC Partnership, Infrastructure Ontario. And so I think the government is going to help, you know, support them as much as they can. And the other side of it is funding. You know, if TIFIA program gets extended, if the water, you know, WIFIA program actually can be used with PABs, if the PABs caps are lifted, if tax exempt financing can be used for all P3s moving forward, you know, you may see more interest in it. Um, but I think that there's a greater appreciation from governments now of risk transfer. You know, certain risks can be transferred under this model that, you know, helps to be priced, you know, for a certain price, but it provides the governments with greater cost certainty and potential cost savings. And I think getting that knowledge there and that experience is starting to show. And as that kind of continues, you'll see the market develop and grow, but it's never going to be as dominant into the tax exempt market. There's too much infrastructure needs and investment in this country, you know, for this ever to be more than a small percentage. You know, even in high use countries, it's less than 10% of total investment. I would agree. Uh, I think there's significant uh, interest from this administration to, to promote this and, and, and provide infrastructure and, and different sources of funding for infrastructure. One challenge is um, that there isn't a lot of in, information uh, or clarity in terms of uh, actual numbers and the cost savings and, and really a, a strong demonstrated case because there are private partners and some of that information is held close to the best. So when you're trying to analyze one procurement method versus the other, um, there hasn't been a, a lot of research done into, you know, this is how the P3 model is going to save you money over the long term. And I think to some extent, and, and I think uh, Eric mentioned this earlier, there is some headline risk. So you have Ileana, you have uh, Indianapolis, you have what happened in Virginia with uh, 460, which, you know, despite or, or regardless of what the actual outcome is in the end, whether you recover the money or don't recover the money or if you move forward or move forward in a different way, create some, some barriers to entry here. Uh, so I think um, there has to be a certain level of acceptance first at the state level, and then you can bring in the, the, the federal government. I think there's been efforts um, at, at the at the federal uh, government to, to at least start exploring how they could develop some uniform standards for this P3 to, to deal with more of a cookie cutter approach that everybody feels comfortable with. Uh, but I think that that necessarily that doesn't that hasn't necessarily moved forward. Um, so there's there's still some barriers uh, to the P3 model becoming greater. Yeah, I would echo. I'm oh, sorry. No, I'm. I done. would echo. Yeah, sorry, John. I guess I would echo what John and John have both said. Um, I think there is from the administration at the federal level clear support. Um, they have taken some steps, created. Uh, kind of a P3 center within the transportation department, proposed different legislation, included things in their budget proposals to foster them. Um, but there's only so much they can do, and part of that is, as we've alluded to before, 50 different states, all with sovereign powers and abilities to kind of choose their own path. So um, there's only so much the federal government, I think, can do. But they can certainly uh, play, play a role and be supportive. Things like expanding TIFIA, things like that um, are, are important if this market is, is to grow. Well, perfect. Uh, we're at 326, and I think we've got as close to 330 as we can. I, I've, obviously, there's always more questions. We can talk for days on this, but I think at this point, uh, since we still have no additional questions from any of the other membership, I think we will go ahead and set up and conclude. Uh, in ending, I would like to thank the panelists again for speaking. Uh, Corey, great job as usual. Uh, Bob Watson, again, thanks for all of your support. And I uh, really appreciate all the membership showing up here as well. I think obviously when we bring speakers here and then we have the large audience that we are able to get, I think that always just brings in for setting the foundation for future webinars and getting 
just continuously great speakers to come and talk to us. So thank you to the membership, and I think at this point we'll go ahead and conclude. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.